Now, a couple of interesting papers in The Lancet I've just read I want to bring to you. The first one is about the feasibility of controlling uh, COVID-19 outbreaks by isolating cases and contacts. So this is the sort of containment phase we're in, really, in the United Kingdom. We've got a few cases and we're trying to contain them. And this is going to be the same whenever the virus arrives somewhere new into an uninfected population. We need to try and contain it as much as we can. So isolation is a strategy. We want to isolate people who have the infection so they can't go on and infect others around about them. And also we need to isolate contacts of the infected people and the people known to be infected because the contacts can be incubating the disease and need to be isolated. Now this isolation can be self-isolation or it can be professional isolation in a quarantined closed department. Now, who do, how do we know who the contacts are? Well, we have to use contact tracing. So we have to find out who the patients are with the infection and then work out who they have come into contact with. This is called contact tracing. And this is a vital part in either curtailing an epidemic or stopping an epidemic. So let's see which one we're at here from this, from this evidence. Now, this paper used quite sophisticated mathematical modelling. But it did point out that containment is harder if the pathogen has infectiousness before symptom onset. And of course, with COVID-19, we now know this to be the case. It's infectious, probably from 12 to 24 hours after someone first is exposed to the virus. Well before they develop clinical features, they can be infectious and spreading it round. So that's already going to make it harder. Now, with SARS, this was not the case. People with SARS were just shedding the virus when they were sick, particularly in the second week of the illness. So it was easier to identify infectious people because they were lying around being sick, whereas now infectious people can be bouncing around living a normal life. This is the problem. Contact tracing and isolation might not contain outbreaks of COVID-19 unless very high levels of contact tracing. So this contact tracing procedure has to be a very effective for this to work. So when we look at the infectiousness of the COVID-19, then we see that it makes it, it means that even if, if one or two people escape without being detected, then they, those people can go on with this R naught of about 2.6 of spreading it to other people. Now this R naught that I've just said is 2.6 means on average, each infected person will infect 2.6 uninfected people. So the more of those infected people we can catch and quarantine and self-isolate or isolate in some way, the less people they're going to infect. But in order to curtail the epidemic and make the numbers start going down, this level of contact tracing must be of a very high order. We must be able to basically contact most of the, uh, the, the contacts of people that have been fe infectious, that are spreading the condition. And that's very often quite hard to do. So subclinical infection or, as I mentioned, um, well, no, subclinical infection. This means that someone is infectious when they are not demonstrating clinical features. They themselves are subclinical, but they are infectious. And as we've mentioned, a high fraction of transmission before the onset of symptoms. So we've got two lots of problems here. We know that about 80 percent of people have mild disease. And if they have mild disease, they might just carry on with their daily lives, but be shedding the virus to other people round about them, coughing it onto surfaces, spreading it with their hands, um, sneezing it out, even breathing it out. So people that are subclinical just carry on and carrying on with their daily lives as normal, infecting the healthy people around about them. And the same with people that are infectious before they develop symptoms, also spreading the disease before they develop symptoms. So both of these factors are a problem with this COVID-19 disease. Now, the models that these uh, authors in The Lancet uh, 28th of February were using depend on the precise characteristics of transmission of the virus, which remain actually unclear. So as of the 28th of February, these uh, authors in The Lancet were saying the transmission characteristics are not entirely clear. We believe, well, we know it's droplet infection, coughing, sneezing, probably breathing things out. 
onto contaminated surfaces as well so direct from someone's uh, exhaled air into our mouth nose or eyes or from someone's infected respiratory tract onto a surface which I touch with my hands and I then infect my face with so we're pretty sure about that but other modes of transmission and just how transmissible that is for example how long it will live on surfaces aren't entirely clear at the moment we're pretty sure it will live on surfaces but we're not entirely sure for how long we're assuming it could be several days so hard to mathematically model precisely because of these ongoing uncertainties because this is a novel virus rapid and effective contract contact tracing can reduce the initial number of cases so we want to stop this initial cluster of cases from developing because they're going to spread everything out and at the moment in the UK we're in this containment phase it would be lovely to think we could eradicate the condition altogether but realistically what we're trying to do is dramatically slow it down the more we can slow it down the better the less people will be sick all at the same time. We want to slow this down as much as we can, delay it as much as we can while we wait for drugs and vaccines to be developed. So rapid and effective contact tracing can reduce the initial number of cases, which would make the outbreak easier to control overall. So in other words, if you reduce the number of initial cases, because if each case is infecting two, then that's going to double outwards, isn't it? So if we can reduce the number of initial cases from, say, 16, down to two that's going to greatly slow the outbreak down and that's what we're trying to do at this stage so basically that paper's telling us it is difficult to slow this virus down uh, for reasons of its uh, transmissibility characteristics and the asymptomatic and uh, pre-symptomatic carriers but it is possible but it requires remarkably good contact tracing and then remarkably good isolation and containment of the infected cases. So basically that paper is saying it's theoretically possible but practically very difficult and it's talking about it's talking about the UK, it's talking about an advanced uh, Western country. And then the next paper I read in The Lancet um, was it kind of seemed to follow on from that in a strange way because it's talking about the looming threat of COVID-19 infection in Africa which of course is a very different circumstance to um, advanced Western countries. Now in advanced Western countries we have massive difficulties. So in Africa it's going to be even more difficult. And these authors said we need to act collectively and we need to act fast. Now they're both difficult to achieve. Uniformity of purpose in African countries is difficult to achieve and moving fast is difficult to achieve. It's difficult everywhere. It can take the European Union years to make a decision and African countries and the unions of African countries are the same. So, but, but if we want to contain this and stop it spreading in Africa, because right from the start of this epidemic, what we've been saying is the big threat is getting cases in countries with poorly developed health systems and then that can spread rapidly in those, in those challenged areas making big clusters of cases which can then spread out to everywhere else because this virus does not respect borders. Now, looking at Africa particularly, there's an awful lot of air traffic and trade between Africa and China. That's one thing. And there still are flights going on. They have been reduced. Some airlines aren't flying, but some still are. And uh, that is really a, a big problem. That there's these ongoing flights between Africa and China. Um, now, to say that African healthcare systems are already challenged is really gross understatement. There's difficulty in screening. There's difficulty in containment. There's a lack of drugs. There's a lack of x-ray facilities for the whole population. There's a lack of nurses and doctors. There's a lack of trained epidemiologists. Basically, there's a lack of everything that we would need to effectively contain an epidemic. So to say it's challenged is a great understatement. It is certainly highly challenged, greatly deficient in many areas. Even at the best of times, a lot of poor people in Africa don't get anything like effective healthcare. So it's already very difficult, and this would be this extra massive burden potentially. Now, the authors of this paper, Lancet, uh, the 27th of February, point out as we knew, 
no treatments, no vaccines, no pre-existing immunity. No treatments for the next few weeks until we get some data from the Chinese clinical trials. Even then, that's not guaranteed. We're hopeful, but we don't know. No vaccine in 2020. There's a lot of 2020 left. We're not going to get a vaccine until 2021 available for mass use. And it's a novel virus, so there's no pre-existing immunity. So that means that people will be very prone to infection from the virus because they will have no innate immunity to it. Well, they'll have a certain degree of innate immunity from their, from their skin and everything, but they won't have any specific acquired immunity to it. They will be naive to the virus, therefore prone to being infected, infected with it. And we've looked at cases this morning of, of the Thai taxi driver, for example, who died aged, no, it wasn't a taxi driver, it was a retail worker, who died aged 35 because he had COVID-19, but he also had dengue fever. So it seems if there's comorbidities going on, the probability of getting this disease seriously or um, terminally are greatly increased. And we know this is true for heart disease, hypertension, chronic lung disease. But also endemic in Africa, we've got human immunodeficiency virus causing the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And the proportion of the population in some African countries that have HIV is frighteningly high. I haven't checked, but a few years ago I checked, and overall the, the amount of people in Kenya, for example, just to take one African country um, at random, th there was about 16 or 7, probably 17% of people who were HIV positive in the country. Now, it is being reduced to some extent, but there's still an awful lot of HIV in Africa and, and the immunosuppression that goes with that. And there's an incredible amount of tuberculosis in this world. Now, we like to think of tuberculosis as, as, as a disease of the past, but you go to any Indian slum or village and, or, or any poor place in, in Africa and you'll find cases of tuberculosis. It's a really common infection. And sometimes that tuberculosis is very difficult to treat. There's something called MDR-TB, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis. And this is endemic. So what happens if someone gets COVID-19 who's already got HIV? What happens if someone gets COVID-19 who's already got tuberculosis? What happens if someone gets COVID-19 who's already got malaria? Well, we don't know the answer to all these questions in detail, but I'm not optimistic. I think these people are going to be affected really potentially quite dramatically because these diseases haven't been dealt with, that they are endemic in the population. Sexually transmitted diseases are endemic in Africa. And emerging infections, for example, two viral infections that strike terror into the, into the, into the mind of the epidemiologist, uh, Ebola virus disease and Lassa hemorrhagic fever. They're pretty frightening to me, never mind an epidemiologist. Uh, but both with a high, I mean, Ebola can have death rates of 60% or more. Um, so hopefully they're not there all the time, but there's always the threat of these diseases. And as well as that, in Africa, there's increased incidence of non-communicable diseases. So diabetes, obesity, hypertension, heart disease, chronic lung disease. These non-communicable diseases are also going to mean that infection with COVID-19 has a more dramatic effect on the individual, making severe disease and death more likely. So all these problems are just sitting there in Africa, sort of waiting really for the arrival of this virus, meaning that large clusters could potentially develop, leading to large clusters of potentially severe complications for which the healthcare infrastructure to treat is simply not there. This is going to greatly increase the case fatality rate. No question about that. So the case fatality rate in places with poor healthcare systems are going to be higher than people who live in areas with good healthcare systems. It's a tragic fact of the state of the world at the moment. That is going to be the case. So Africa, a lot of vulnerability
great vulnerability there. That's that's what I'm worried about. Now, highest importation risk in these authors. Remember, we're still on the uh, the Lancet 27th of February study. Highest importation risk: Egypt, Algeria. South Africa, there's already a case in Egypt. So this is where there's most air traffic and things going back and forth between China and other factors that are going to, that the modelers took into account. So Egypt, Algeria, South Africa, most at risk. So we can expect outbreaks in Egypt, Algeria, South Africa, I'm afraid. We can expect cases in those countries. They may even be there already. It's quite possible. Testing up until recently has been very problematic. Um, just a few weeks ago, there was only a few, I think two or three or four African countries could test. The World Health Organization has made more tests available, but still it's a challenge. Now, moderate risk countries. Um, and, and given the amount of traveling back and forward between these countries in Africa, I wouldn't say the risk is actually that moderate. I would say the risk is actually fairly significant but anyway the, 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 the modelers in this paper are saying moderate risk. Nigeria, crowded country Nigeria that you know the, the disease could spread so rapidly in poorer areas of Nigeria. Ethiopia again massive shanty towns and things around about Addis Ababa. Um, Sudan, Angola, Tanzania, Ghana and Kenya. So unfortunately I, I'm going to be surprised that if in a month's time we don't have cases in all of these countries. I deeply, deeply hope I'm wrong because of all these problems I've pointed out, how devastating this disease can be to these already very difficult uh, areas of the world in terms of healthcare provision. But I'm afraid this is probably going to happen. So, given this is going to happen, these authors, Lancet 27th of February, point out four things. First point, Africa needs a unified, continent-wide strategy for preparedness and response. That's what it needs. The question is, is it going to get it and get it quick? Because remember, this has to be fast. We're talking weeks, not months and years. Given what you know about the difficulties in Africa, are you optimistic? Two, requires a common political will. Given what you know about the politics of Africa, is that likely to emerge in the next few weeks? Now, I don't want to be overly pessimistic because a common external enemy can be a great unifying force. I just so hope that's the case and that African governments really try and get their act together and there's a common political will for preparedness and response. Three, well, let's think what we're going to need. Masses of personal protective equipment. Uh, money to uh, pay workers. Probably to train up more workers in the short term if we can. Uh, huge numbers of masks, oxygen tubing, oxygen cylinders, antibiotics, full range of drugs, intravenous fluids, medical devices, diagnostic devices, x-ray facilities. We could go on and on and on. All these things cost money. And at the moment, it's not available. And we need it fast. Fourthly. Fourth recommendation from the authors if we're going to uh, avert this looming threat of COVID-19 infection in Africa. Proper quarantine and infection control protocols everywhere. You see, if you contain it in one country and you do an absolutely splendid job in one country and the country next door completely hashes it up, then the disease is just gonna come across the border. This has to be everywhere or it's not going to work. Proper quarantine and infection control protocols, including procedures for implementing social distancing. We need social distancing. In fact, we need social distancing here, now, everywhere now we need social distancing. But I'll probably talk about that more, more later. So that was just two papers from The Lancet that I found interesting. One about the difficulty in containment of the virus, even with very good 
um, community health and contact tracing and isolation. And then the need for these uh, interventions in Africa to prevent this looming threat and uh, how much more difficult that level of contact tracing, surveillance and then management is going to be in the African situation. So the bottom line here is I feel this disease is going to start community spreading in Africa in the next few weeks. I really hope I'm wrong, but um, given what we know about the transmission of the virus so far, that is likely. And uh, at the moment, I'm not brimming with optimism that systems will be prepared for that contingency.